some now allege that even without global warming, fire management in Australia has been unable to prevent megafires. In 2003, one of the worst bushfire disasters of modern times occurred in and around our nation's capital. On January the 18th, extreme weather conditions fanned the flames as a firestorm engulfed the suburbs of Canberra. Couldn't get any water bloody pressure because it was mainly just in the carport. And now it's just spreading to his, that's his lounge and, uh, Dining room, so she's gone. Four people lost their lives, and nearly 500 homes were destroyed. Mount Stromlo Observatory was gutted, and Canberra's water supply seriously polluted. Firefighting is not an exact science, and the Canberra story shows how bad judgment calls can have drastic consequences. In future, with climate change, these kinds of judgments will be even more critical. On the afternoon of January the 8th, a lightning strike started a fire in New South Wales, in a remote part of the Brindabella National Park, known as McIntyre's Hut. It was one of four fires which would end up hitting Canberra ten days later. Wayne West, who owns Waiora Station, an 860-acre property next to the National Park, remembers vividly how the fire developed. On that first night, he called New South Wales Fire Control to find out what was happening. They showed very little concern with the fire, and um, I was under the impression that the fire was just a lightning strike of very little concern at the time. Then he visited the site. I went to the fire that evening. And what did you see? Well, the flame height at the fire was not at all high. It was a low flame height, and the fire was burning with very low intensity. Would it have been dangerous for firefighters to go there and fight it? Well, at, at no time did I f feel as though I was endangered or um, intimidated by the fire at all, and that was right through to the um, 17th of um, January. The McIntyre's hut fire was one of a number set off by lightning storms. There were multiple fires throughout the area. Every effort was made by a local incident management team to do what was necessary to contain those fires, bearing in mind that the, at round about the time those fires started and in the succeeding days, the forecast was for predominantly easterly winds. So obviously their focus was to look at containment on the western side rather than the eastern side because of the forecast conditions. The New South Wales Rural Fire Service didn't tackle the McIntyre's hut fire head on that afternoon or evening. The decision not to hit the fire fast at its source would prove to be fatal. Later, fire chiefs would claim that firefighters were being protected from potential grave danger. Phil Koperberg, a Labour candidate in the New South Wales elections, is also the state's Rural Fire Service Commissioner. The incident controller um, told me on more than one occasion, and, and my conversations with him and his deputy were not infrequent, uh, that to have commenced a direct attack on the fire would have endangered fire. And that has to be his call. But this film, never before seen on television, shows a team of CSIRO observers monitoring the fire on that first afternoon and evening. The film was shot by the son of one of Australia's foremost bushfire experts, the CSIRO's Phil Cheney. Now, your son was filming this part of the landscape. Was he in any danger? No, not at all. They came in looking for spot fires and uh, trying to map the position of the fire uh, and how many spot fires there were, but uh, he, uh, he certainly wasn't in any danger. The biggest danger up here is fallen trees. But uh, some of these trees will catch a light and will fall without warning. So in your view, the fire could and should have been fought at that time? Absolutely. I mean, that was the safest time of this fire ever. 
And if you don't take advantage of the first safe period, then you're immediately way, way, way behind the eight ball. Well, Phil Cheney is an eminent scientist, but Phil Cheney is not a firefighting entity and therefore has not had to deal with the possibility of committing human resources to a particular incident. Um, and he forms an opinion. Uh, and other people form different opinions. And the decision was arrived at and has to be supported that firefighters may well have been endangered. Over the next 10 days, the McIntyre's Hut fire slowly spread. What I seen from the night of the 8th to the 17th, uh, the fire burned very, very slowly. Very, very, very slowly. So there was time to tackle it properly? I believe so, yes, from what I witnessed. Peter Caffles was a senior officer in the Rural Fire Service working on the fire ground and in the Yass Fire Control Centre while the Canberra fires progressed. On or around January the 9th, he went to a meeting of fire chiefs in Queenbeyan at which the McIntyre's Hut fire was discussed. He was surprised by a comment made by a member of the New South Wales Rural Fire Service and is telling this story publicly for the first time. One of the paid staff of the RFS said, oh, it's only shit country, it's burning pretty slow, why not let it burn? And they all seized on that as a brilliant idea. And that was the end of the meeting. They actually decided by consensus to, to do nothing. And I sort of lived with this a year or two and I ultimately wrote to the coroner, Maria Dugan, and told her this. There may have been a range of individuals with separate opinions and there may well have been a nodding of heads. Uh, and, uh, and we all know where the odd indiscreet comment uh, will ultimately lead us. Uh, but the team itself, the people who were ultimately responsible for making the decisions, uh, never, never could be accused of any level of complacency in this, and haven't been. Many firefighters, including Peter Cathell's son, Tim, were left on the sidelines, despite being eager to go in and tackle the blaze. I think we could have controlled the McIntyre's hut fire those first few days if we'd have had... Uh, be OK to go ahead. I'm certain we could have. Now, Tim wanted to go and fight the fire on January the 8th, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he, he wanted to go, and they were stopped from going by their local paid staff. One was in Yarralumlashire and the other one's Yashire. How did he react to that? Uh, he wasn't happy at all. The judgment had been made not to go in fast and attack the fire directly, but instead to try and contain it by lighting backburns where sometimes vast tracts of land are lit in front of a fire to burn off fuel and stop the fire spreading. Three days after the McIntyre's hut lightning strike, one of these backburns was lit. The idea was to have a backburn along the Brindabella range, then along this power line track out to the Goodradigby River and so that that would sort of draw a line around the fire and keep it behind those lines. I made a phone call to the fire controller saying to him at that particular time that the weather conditions up here were hot, the wind was blowing from the northerly direction, blowing to the south, and the backburn was to be burnt to the north, and uh, I said the conditions would, would not suit backburning. He told me, Wayne, you don't see the big picture. It was not heavy fuel loads in my opinion, but lots of fine flashy fuels, which made the uh, fire difficult to contain. Uh, it was very dry and uh, any little sparks crossing the trail uh, could easily lead the fire to escape. So did they listen to you? No. They went ahead and did it? They went ahead with a backburn and in doing that backburn the fire jumped the containment line immediately to the south and they brought helicopters in then to try and contain that out outbreak. For several days after this, helicopters travelled to and from Wayne West's property, collecting water from his dam to drop on the fire. One in particular, the Incredible Hulk, was draining 9,000 litres every three minutes, so Wayne West and his family set up pumps to refill the dam from the nearby Goodra Digby River. Later, Wayne West asked an officer from the Rural Fire Service for a four-inch pump and 130 metres of hose. 
It would have allowed him and his family to protect his house, but it was never supplied. On January the 16th, Wayne West and two of his neighbors crossed the river and put out a fire which they'd seen in the national park. They cut down burning trees and monitored the fire throughout the night. Wayne West was feeling more and more anxious. The next day, he again called fire control in New South Wales. At this phone call, I was getting a little bit of aggressive on the phone and I had a response come back, should the fire cross the river, we'll put it out. How do you feel about that now? Uh, very flippant statement, made with no intent. By January the 17th, weather conditions were deteriorating. Four major fires were spreading, and in a last-ditch effort to stop the progress of the McIntyre's hut fire, the New South Wales firefighters lit another backburn at 11 a.m., this time from the air. The gamble failed, and the backburn itself escaped, adding to the final run of fires into Canberra. Was it right of the New South Wales Rural Fire Service to drop aerial incendiary devices to start a backburn? Yes, but not at the time that they did it. To light up on a, a very high fire danger, and especially when that's forecast possible extreme in the afternoon, we know we're going to lose that. That's our experience, we're going to lose that fire. So, no, it was the wrong time to do it. If they had done it skillfully the evening before, they could well have achieved a safe burnout of that area and not had any uh, escapes over the fire line. But they really should have done it about three or four, five, four days before on a smaller area. In a perfect world, you would only do a backburn if you were able to do it with the wind, not against the wind. Well, we would know that you could only do a backburn at dusk. And in a perfect world, you would be able to uh, put an aircraft up in the air at 7 o'clock at night when conditions may well have moderated and do a major aerial incendiary run. But in real life, that doesn't happen. That night, the fire crossed the Goodra Digby River, bringing it that much closer to Wayne West's property. Again, he called New South Wales Fire Control, and on this occasion, he was told to call Triple O. It was his 24th phone call. But you were ringing them to ask for help. Yes. You'd been in touch with them more than 20 times before. You'd helped them with water from your dam. You'd crossed the river, you'd fought the fire yourself and now they were telling you to ring triple O. That's 100% correct. Hard to believe, but that's, that's exactly what happened. Around midday the next day, on January the 18th, the fire suddenly changed direction and overran Wayne West's home. He and his family were ordered to leave. The danger was too great. I, I, I think it was better to save lives than to save a house, yes. That afternoon, the fires raced into Canberra on two major heads, covering the last 20 kilometers into Canberra's suburbs in an hour, with tragic results. It was a hopeless cause, because there was no warning. There was just total devastation within seconds, as you can see. Everything just went off like a bomb. You could hear the crackling and the rumbling of the flames coming toward us. And I just couldn't believe the speed at which they reached my place. So that's how quickly it spread. It just came through here like it was being pushed by a cyclone. Staring, yep. Couldn't believe it. And uh, it was already into the house. And the funny thing is, it sort of got into this house, but it hasn't touched the trees. <laughs> it's just, that's how frightening it is. It must have come in from their back fence. Yeah. Um, where we had a barbecue areas, we had an outdoor um, sink outside, we used to do our dishes on, we had an outdoor table, um, we had river rocks underneath here for the pavement. The decision not to fight the McIntyre's hut fire at the outset had proved catastrophic, not just for Wayne West and his property, but for the city of Canberra as a whole. Wayne West's home was left a charred wreck. The loss of our house, we, we can accept that, but once we got in the camera and found out the devastation and, and the four lives had been lost, I mean, 
That was hard to take. Are you angry about what happened? Probably very, very disappointed to 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 be at the fire on the eighth of January and witness what happened and see what happened in Canberra, yes. Very, very I mean it's a hard pill to swallow that you do see something and um, see what happened at the end that um, that was preventative as far as I could see. I felt like, well, I lit the fire that burnt down Canberra. I was there with hundreds of other firefighters uh, lighting backburns and, you know, somewhere or other those fires grew to become the fires that swept into Canberra and, and that's a, a, a gut feeling, I suppose. Um, it's not a rational analysis of the history of the fire but it is dramatic for me and it, it still weighs on my mind uh, as I guess a personal failure and the only way we believe that the truth will be told is through legal action we regret deeply that Wayne West uh, lost property as we regret profoundly that 500 families lost their property as a consequence of what happened once the fire got into the ACT under appalling conditions. Uh, in exactly the same way, we, we, we regret profoundly when a rescue team is unsuccessful in extricating a patient before he or she dies. But that does not go to issues of competency or commitment or dedication. In the aftermath of the Canberra fires, a number of inquiries criticised the way the fires in the ACT were managed there. The coroner's court is now in session. ACT coroner Maria Dugan, who had no jurisdiction over New South Wales, said the failure to aggressively attack the fires in the first few days after they ignited was one factor that led to the firestorm. Do you accept now that it was a mistake not to tackle the McIntyre's hut fire at the outset? More, more aggressively? If we had known on that day that notwithstanding the forecast of easterly winds thus presenting us with a problem to the west of the fire, it was all going to, in subsequent days, reverse, then would we have done things differently? Most certainly. There are no winners in this debate about firefighting tactics. The families whose relatives lost their lives the homeowners who lost their homes, the firefighters who wished they'd been able to contain the fires, all are victims of what occurred in Canberra. We need to put aside blame and anger and just look at the facts, look at the timeline, what happened, where and when, what were the weather conditions, what were the options, what options were considered, what options weren't, what could have been done different, and try and learn from it. I don't think anger and blame's